So it's November 1st. Can't really believe that we've already kicked it into November now. Uh, it was Halloween the day before. I'm not a big Halloween guy, but I don't. Are, are you much of a Halloween guy, Jeff? I don't. You don't I've strike not me been as a Halloween big... guy since I was a kid. You know, never? it was uh, fun to do back then. But now, um, even in our neighborhood, we've never been a uh, a big trafficked house. Like early, early when I got here, um, it was funny because you know the the Marlins had just started and. I guess people knew that we had moved into this house. So people would literally drive into our neighborhood and drop the kids off just to come to our house and they get back in their cars and leave to go to another neighborhood. Cause we only got like 10 houses on our street. So, and it's far between other neighborhoods. So they're not going to walk here. So the parents were actually dropping off at our house. They'd get back in the car and leave and go somewhere else, which I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th those are the things where I'm in New York city now and like, what does trick or treating look like here? Uh, it's it's so different to me. Uh, I never was a big costume guy. My mom told me I used to used to pull off the costumes as a kid, and then I, as I got older, just wore different baseball jerseys every year. I was always really lame about that. But uh, you're wearing a baseball jersey now. That's usually what my costume was, and, and we'll get to that one in a minute. But as we are recording this, it's a little bit before the first game, or excuse me, the World Series game that could end up deciding it. Right? It's three one in favor of the Braves. And we're going to talk about your experience being on both sides because you've experienced being on the 3-1 side, trying to close a team out or 3-2 side, trying to close a team out. And you've also made the 3-1 comeback as we talked about it with the Steve Bartman situation, but you had to rattle off a few more victories after that to finalize that NLCS uh, rally there and get to the World Series. I'm excited to talk about that. I also, before we get there, I just want to talk about the last game. Because it ended up surprisingly being a pitcher's duel or somewhat of a low scoring game, I think would be a better way of describing it because it was a lot of different pitchers dueling. But for the Astros, it was their starter, Zach Greinke, who nobody really was expecting to be counted on in this postseason. He's making 87 work, uh, similar to like we talked about with Adam Wainwright, but he does it a little bit different with a 69 mile an hour curveball. He's just so much finesse. And then he was also up there at the plate, laced a single, almost had another hit. And when they pinch hit for Granky, I was almost thinking at that point, no offense to Marwin Gonzalez at this point in his career. He's had a solid career, but I was thinking, I'd almost rather have Zach Granky swing it there. So I just wanted to get your thoughts first, just seeing a veteran guy on his way out, like Zach Granky battling out there in the World Series for scoreless. Unfortunately, the way the game is now and the way it's managed, he, we didn't get to see him get stretched out a little bit further, but I mean, he was special. He's yeah, he's a special pitcher. And, uh, you know, we've gotten to watch him a long time. And I think when you look back at the days where he had his anxiety disorder and basically was almost out of baseball until he got that conquered. And now, uh, you know, he'd won 200 and almost 220 games in the big leagues uh, to get over that and decide in the massive deal that he did after winning the Cy Young in Kansas City. I mean, this guy is an elite pitcher. And even though the velocity is not there anymore, he used to have you know, that 94 mile an hour turbo sink that was uh, just a nightmare for hitters, great slider, great changeup. Um, but his demeanor on the mound has always impressed me. It doesn't seem like he's ever rattled at all. So you watch him last night and he's gr he grunts like crazy for one. Yeah. You could hear on every single pitch that he's like, yeah, <laughs> grunting like crazy with uh, 87, 88. I think he hit 91 maybe once or twice, 90 a couple times. But that might be one of the part uh, of the reasons he's so successful is the, the hitters reacting to that grunt, like, damn, this thing's going to come at me at 95, but it's, it's really not. And he grunts on every pitch. So you think maybe a grunt is a fastball. Nope. A grunt could be a changeup uh, that really throws you off. And it's, yes, we're talking about lack of velocity compared to most pitchers now, but the quality of his pitches are still ridiculous. I mean, his changeup is insane. He's got uh, that 68, 69 mile an hour curveball you're talking about that has huge bend in it and can throw for strikes anytime. He just knows how to pitch. And I think that's a great lesson to learn for kids out there that don't throw 100 miles an hour that want to be successful in this game. You've got to learn how to pitch and not just be a, uh, what do we call them, the showcase kids now that yeah. just try to throw it as hard as they possibly can, put the big velo numbers up, and guys get drafted like that. But be a pitcher and you can get drafted that route as well. A hundred percent. And we've seen some more players start to break through a recent draft pick, Dylan Smith out of Alabama. Uh, I really am a big fan of, but it's a guy that just spins the ball well and locates. And, and I was just doing a write up on the tiger system. And I was like, finally, more guys like this making their way there, because I thought you brought up a really good point when we talked about Wainwright, which was 
Yes, he's only throwing upper 80s, maybe touching 90. But as a hitter, you're more prepared for what you're going to see. So if it's 69 to 88, you're still dealing with those big velo bumps and that 88 is going to look like gas because you've got to also be ready to wait for 69 or 68 or whatever it is. And so that's the thing that Granky does a good job of is he still gives you those three distinct speeds. He'll give you something in the high seventies. He'll give you something in the high eighties and he'll give you something in the 68 range, sometimes even in the 50 range when he goes with the EFIS every once in a while, I was wondering if he was going to break that one out, but it was fun to watch him out there on the mound. Obviously we don't know how much longer he's going to pitch. And it was just cool to see him competing out there and, the grunt on a 69 mile an hour curveball is a bit counterintuitive, but it makes sense because it's the psychology of it too, right? If you're hearing it on every pitch, he's not tipping. He's not giving you an idea of what's coming. And it, it was fun to watch him throw. That being said, I, I know where you're probably going to sit on this, but you know, I think in these situations, the numbers to a degree in today's game, back it up a little bit where if a guy is going around the lineup a third time, the hitters tend to get a lot more comfortable. And I'm sure you can speak to that as a hitter yourself. That didn't deter teams and managers from pulling their pitchers in the past, but now we're seeing that done a lot more frequently now. And with two outs and two runners on, uh, they opted the, the Astros that is to pull Granky, even though he was phenomenal in that outing. How did you feel about that decision? Um, and in general, how do you feel about the quick yanks so far in, in this postseason? Well, I think it's just been the transition of our game uh, into a dominant bullpen related game. So, you know, you used to have your starting pitchers that would take you to the sixth, seventh, eighth inning, and then you have your closer that's there for the ninth always. And then it became the advent of, all right, now we got a setup guy that that's going to be almost a closer. That's not quite a closer. That's going to take care of the eighth. So you got the eighth and ninth kind of locked down. Well, now they've, they fortified these bullpens so much and they're, they're pitching these guys so much they can stretch the back end of the bullpen out more than they ever used to. You know, they used to be the specialists that would come on for one hitter and you lose that guy for the rest of the game. Well, now they have to face at least three batters. They have to get uh, or complete an inning. And these six, seven, eighth inning guys can go multiple innings now and still save the closer, still save the setup guys. So uh, you've shortened. It's very rare to see a starting pitcher go over 200 innings now, which back in the day, you know, uh, we're talking 70s and 80s, 300 was the benchmark as far as innings pitched for a good starter that would have a, a good amount of innings for the year. Now, most guys aren't even eclipsing 200, 100 less innings every year, which is crazy to think. And I think just the, uh, you know, I want to see that guy, I want to see Granky left in the game because for me as a manager, you're still saving arms and pitches in the bullpen, but he knows that these guys are in shape. He knows these guys can handle the load of going back there back to back multiple nights and, you know, throwing their 97, 98 miles an hour for three outs. And what I think about it too, is, is it does create a little bit more of an importance on the manager at that point too, because now you're really strategizing. You're really figuring out how you're going to budget your bullpen. And that is the cool chess piece type of aspect to it. Um, I think there's some interesting components to it. I do still love to see the starter go. You know, I want to see that starter role. When he's, when he's dealing, I want to see how far he can take it. Ian Anderson with the Braves has been spectacular. He's technically a rookie because of the weird 2020. Regardless, he's younger than 25 years old. He's 24 years old and, and just doing so well on the big stage. That changeup is unbelievable. And I would like to see him get stretched out. But, of course, you know, they end up pulling him as well before the third time around the lineup. And, uh, you know, that's where we're at. When it was 2003 – it was a little bit different. 2003, you had some starting pitchers get stretched out. And a big reason why the Marlins and that team you were a part of were able to get far was because of Josh Beckett being stretched out during the series. But you guys also had to get past a Cubs team that had some really darn good starters that were going deep into games all year long, whether it was Mark Pryor, Kerry Wood, or even a Carlos Zambrano. You found yourself down three to one. We talked about the Bartman game, but even then, you still had to rattle off the rest of that game and then win two more against, if I'm not mistaken, it was Mark Pryor and then no, that Kerry was, Wood. In game that, was seven. The Mark, that was the Mark, Mark Pryor well, Mark game. Pryor was the game six one. So you had to win the game before that. And then right. you got to game six. That happens. And then you had to beat Kerry Wood in game seven. So before the game six then, how do you go? What's the mindset to, to, to kind of put yourself in the Astros shoes here? Like what, or for people to understand what the Astros 
are, are, are dealing with at this point, because as we put this out, they're either would have made it three to two or it's over. And the Braves are world series champions. We're going to talk about closing it out too, on that side of it, but from the comeback component, what is your mindset as a team? You're down three, one against a really darn good team, obviously, whether it's the world series or the NLCS, how do you have the confidence that you can rattle off three straight wins and, and try to get out of that? What's the general feel? Well, the general feel is you can't look at it as we got to go three more wins. We got to look at it as game by game. So tonight is a game that we have to win, obviously, but we're not looking three games ahead to see what the end of the series is going to be like. When 2003, the way that team was comprised, our mentality was, I don't ever remember us feeling pressured like, oh my God, you know, sticking our heads in the sand saying there's no way we can do this. We got, uh, you know, Zambrano and and prior and wood to face uh, to even close the series out. We focused on game five. We, we did that. And it, it was a huge boost for us because Josh Beckett, um, how he didn't throw no hitter that night was uh, quite shocking. I think he gave up two hits. Uh, he threw a two hit shutout that night and was one of the most dominant performances I've seen. Uh, I don't think the hits were either uh, even hit that hard. He just uh, went out there. He took the ball and said, jump on my back tonight guys we're going to get back to Chicago and he absolutely dominated the Cubs I think it was a four nothing game we won that one um so it was a comfortable game we never really had um any like close moments thinking that we were going to lose that game so that we just built on that momentum going uh and then we were like all right we won that one now let's go focus on Mark Pryor and obviously you know Mark Pryor was dominant for seven and a third innings. He only needed five more outs. They only needed five more outs to close that series out. And uh, we went crazy on him, you know, and then then Josh Beckett comes back in game seven and gives us four and two thirds of relief that uh, was uh, remarkable. I mean, you know, that was Jack McKeon though. He's going with his best guys, his hottest guys, and he's going to let them go as long as they can, which is very counter to what today's managers are doing in these playoffs. Absolutely. And we saw what happened even with with guys like Max Scherzer trying to do it at 37 years old. It's tough. But this this was a young, very young and and ready to go, Josh Beckett. And you're pretty spot on on that stat line in that game. You went nine innings, two hits, no runs, 11 Ks, one walk. I mean, that's that's pretty, pretty impressive. And not to mention, you also had a solo shot in that one, too, uh, to help contribute to the four runs. I think three of the runs came off of homers, if I'm not mistaken. It was a Mike Lowell homer. It was a uh, Pudge Rodriguez homer, and it was a Jeff Conine homer. Uh, so you just had solo shots uh, to, to be able to you know, chip away there against a, a really good pitcher in Carlos Zambrano, who obviously didn't go anywhere for a very long time after that either, uh, stuck around for a while, and even had a cameo with the Marlins in that uh, really interesting 2012-13 team uh, that I'll never forget. Um, yeah. <laughs> which, Me speaking either. of, Ozzy Guillen. Ozzy Guillen's getting some looks as a manager too. We'll, we'll have to talk about that <laughs> depending on what happens there. But you go to game six, which we've talked about that game specifically. So we don't need to go too deep into it, but more from the standpoint of you get this galvanizing victory from your starting pitcher. You also have the three home runs. You feel good about what's going on there. And now it's like, okay, we win one and then we win another and we're good. Or even the mentality of we win this game, then the next one is, is, you know, coin flip and whatever happens happens. So I think you, now you feel like you're getting a little bit closer and you get to game six. How are you guys feeling going into that game? Obviously we know what happens with Steve Bartman and, and everything in between. And you all end up you know, down quite a bit in that one, but how'd you feel going into it? Cause I feel like that's something that doesn't usually get discussed. We usually pick up right before the big inning, but what about going into that ball game? No, we knew we had to win, obviously, game five. And, and I think uh, Josh just gave everybody like a shot of adrenaline and just good confidence. So we were going to Chicago confident, even though it was Mark Pryor who was, uh, I don't know if he won, did he win the Cy Young that year? Or he was up there in the voting. I know that because he had a, a tremendous season. Finished first. Um, but we knew that, you know, we're going to have our hands full as far as uh, facing a, a, a tough pitcher. But I don't ever remember – uh, like being anxious or guys being fearful that, you know, we weren't going to be able to do it. And even being down by three going into the eighth inning, 
I think that we just had a, a general feel in the dugout like we always did that, hey, we got this. We can come back from this. We can we can find a way to score runs and win this game, which we did all year long. And it was a Pavano start against Mark Pryor, and Pavano turned in another solid start. You guys hung around, it, and you made that comeback. I feel like once you make that comeback in game six, and you talk about how the team always felt like they were never out of it. You guys never felt out of it. When you make that comeback in game six, I'm sure people talk about momentum and, and it's one thing to feel momentum as a fan on, on the couch. What kind of momentum are you feeling now going into a game seven there where you just pulled off a heartbreaking victory in Chicago for a team that already has those clouds and that ominous curse over them? I think we, we looked at that as part of our fuel. You know, we knew that they hadn't won a, a playoff series or a world series gone to the world series since 1908. So with the comeback and that, you know, the Bartman incident and uh, their sure handed shortstop making an error and we score eight runs. And all of a sudden we've got a wave of confidence going into, I didn't, I don't care who you would have thrown in that game seven. We had so much confidence going into that game. Um, I think we felt we were going to win. We really did. And you go into that game seven, you win nine, six, and the interesting thing about it, too, is that you had to go in those final two games. You had to go to Chicago to win both. And the difference is in this World Series, if the Astros are able to win this one, they go back home now, a place where they play really well, uh, whether it's because of help that they had at home or because the fact they, that they play really well at Minute Maid now. And now we know it's more that they just play well at Minute Maid um, and they're very, they're very good at home. They hit well on, on the home and the road. They were one of the best offensive teams we've, we've seen. So we know what they can do when they, when they get hot. But going on the road and trying to close it out is also really hard. And you had to do that in 03 as well because you moved past this game seven. And you guys take care of business nine to six. It was another game where you got red hot yourself, by the way. You had the home running game in game five, right? And then you had another hit or two in game six. And then you had three hits in game seven. You were just feeling it down the stretch there before the World Series? Yeah, I was, uh, I was locked in. I was locked in against the Cubs. And even with that pitching staff, I just felt, um, you know, you get into those little stretches where the ball seems bigger and the game kind of slows down a little bit. And that happened for me right there because, um, you know, you're facing those guys. But when you're in that state, it doesn't really matter who's throwing on the mound. You know, it, it, you get that much confidence in yourself. You get that much um, feel for being able to handle any velocity, any pitch. And I felt really good that series. And you guys put up a seven spot on Kerry Wood. So you end up going to the World Series. And that was a little bit more, uh, I guess, easy. And I guess in the mindset of it not being as stressful because you get to game six and now you're in the driver's seat. So now we're in the flip side here. So in this, in this instance here, you, you're kind of feeling more like the Atlanta Braves. But imagine that the Braves lose tonight's game. And as people are listening to this, let's say that you got to close it out now on the road for two. You guys were getting ready to do that, potentially. Going to New York, of all places, where you hear all about the ghosts and the magic and Yankee Stadium. This is old Yankee Stadium, and there's just history there and the fans and the atmosphere. And we've talked about that. Not to mention that it was one of the most talented teams that we've seen you know, ever. It was up there with any of the modern teams that we've seen. So there's got to be a level of this is going to be hard to close out. Of course, Josh Beckett is a common theme here, and he's a big reason why game six was able to be closed out by you guys and you win that World Series in New York. But what was the mindset on the flip side? Now relating it more towards the Braves on the road, knowing that you have to win one of the next two. You don't want to get to a game seven because that's where anything can happen. What was the focus and how are you feeling going into a game six where you're in control, but there's still a lot working against you given the, the setup of the structure of the series? Yeah, it was interesting because I was driving in, uh, we were driving in the bus going to the Yankee Stadium for a little workout before the series started. And a good friend of mine who is, well, you know, Jake Marsh, uh, his dad, Greg, yeah. uh, is a huge Yankees fan. They're from New York. You know, they've been Yankees fans their whole entire life. And uh, I remember crossing one of the bridges to go into Manhattan and, and I was talking to him and he's like, he goes, you guys going to win. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? He's the biggest Yankees fan there is. And he's like, they just had their world series. 
they beat the Boston Red Sox in game seven in a dramatic walk-off home run. And he goes, they're exhausted. The fans are exhausted. The players are exhausted. Everybody's exhausted. And he's told me where you're going to win. And you know what, when we lined up on the field for, you know, pregame in game one, it was true. Those fans did not cheer like they normally do there. It was like, yeah, here comes the lowly Florida Marlins. They're coming in here against the giant Yankees. Uh, we're going to crush them and stomp them and we'll be world series champions again for the 28th time or 29th time or whatever it is in their, in their history. And, you know, I, I felt right then in my bones, I'm like, I think he's right. We're going to win this series. But prior to that, you know, we had Dontre Willis, who was a rookie. We had Miguel Cabrera, who's a rookie. And just being around them and seeing their reaction to going to Yankee Stadium, this hallowed ground of baseball, they were playing it as just another game. And they were two huge components of our offense and, and defense, obviously, but they could have cared less that we were at Yankee Stadium going for the World Series. They just thought it was a regular Tuesday night during July sometime. And I think that's kind of the attitude the entire team had. And that's why we closed it out in game six. And what's amazing is in that World Series, you had a lot of those Yankee players not really hitting the, the way that you would expect, except for Bernie Williams. And it's a bit of a, of a jump off the path here, but I just wanted to talk about Bernie Williams because I feel like he's so underappreciated. He's also a great musician now, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah, but big time. Pair of home runs. He was 10 for 25. To me, just such a ball player all around. And a guy that really also, I, I really believe, deserves more Hall of Fame consideration than he gets, given that he played his whole career with one team. He compiled some really good numbers, won four World Series, four gold gloves, five-time All-Star, but I feel like you just never heard a bad thing about this guy. I feel like he just always just played the game the right way, but doesn't really get talked about because he was another dude on a team full of immortal superstars. What, what can you tell me about Bernie Williams? I, that just kind of came to my mind. I'm like, I've never talked about this guy. I feel like he just doesn't get the love he deserves. Yeah, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, smooth and, and class and just going about the business the right way. Bernie Williams was part of those teams that I thought were the best that I've ever played against. And those 96 to 2001 Yankees teams and even 2003 um, obviously was an amazing team as well. But those first group of teams, then they won four out of five World Series was, you know, kind of around him. He was that guy at the top of the lineup that just uh, was a consistent performer every single day, played a great center field, uh, ran the bases well and made good decisions and never threw to the wrong base. And uh, worked at bats. I mean, this guy was just the consummate ball player. And um, I agree with the fact that, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta list him with some of the great Yankee players that have ever put on that uniform. Uh, I agree. And he just is that Yankee guy. Uh, I think also just the way that the fans always had held on to him and, and what he did in that uniform and, and also just being able to handle New York for that long uh, right out of the gate uh, was something that was impressive. Last question on that series is, Andy Pettit was special in that as I'm looking at the numbers. And I remember watching, I've watched that, you know, 2003 watched the games back so many times and Pettit went 15 and two thirds 0.57 ERA in that series. I mean, he, he was really their, their best arm uh, no matter who better than Clemens, better than anybody else uh, in that series. What was working for him that made him just so dominant there? What, what made Pettit so good besides the, the patented pickoff move? Pettit was just uh another one of those guys you get on the mound and, and like Grinky, you just un, you couldn't rattle him. There was nothing that no situation that would rattle him. And uh, you know, I had that cut fastball inside that just tore me up. I had a horrible uh, career batting average against Andy Pettit. Um, for some reason, I just could not hit that guy. Uh, I knew that it was going to be, you know, tough to handle in game six. It was going to be a great matchup between the two. And it's probably gonna be a low scoring game because he's a huge big time performer in the postseason. I think for quite a while held the most victories in postseason for a long time. Um, I know he's probably still right up there, but uh, another one of those guys is just a consummate professional, uh, went about his business the right way and, and a presence on the mound of confidence that you knew uh, there were no chinks in the armor really ever. It doesn't matter what the score was, what kind of trouble he was in, he'd always get away out of it. And to relate it back now to this series, which I'm very much hoping isn't over by the time we publish this episode, because again, a reminder, we're recording this a couple hours before 
what could be the end of the World Series in Game 5, I will be going to Game 6 if there is a Game 6 in Houston. What do the Astros need to do to to be able to rattle off these wins? I I know it's obvious to hit the ball and get outs, right? But from what you've seen, where are they coming up short right now? Because we know how good their offense is. I feel like it's it's just not quite clicking for them at the plate, and it needs to because – They're pitching. They've had guys step up. I thought Luis Garcia has been spectacular. Something really clicked for him through the postseason as a as a rookie. But I mean, if when when you're leaning on a rookie uh, above everybody else, I know they lost Lance McCullers, which was a big blow, and that's a gamer right there. But this just doesn't look like the same Astros team we've been watching all postseason. It seems like they've kind of just had the wind taken out of their sails a little bit. How does that happen on the biggest stage here for a team that is so experienced as they are? And the Braves have a good bullpen as of late, but this is a really good Astros offense. What are you seeing there? Lack of execution. You know, they had plenty of opportunities to score last night and they just couldn't get the big hit. They couldn't get, um, you know, those hits needed that they string together to, to make those big innings. And, you know, in the first inning, they got the bases loaded um, with one out. And they're lucky to get one run because the, you know, the kid that was thrown in there out of the, into the fire for his first major league start, uh, poor guy, how do you do that to him? He doesn't even know it until he gets to the ballpark that day, but uh, to clean up that mess to come in there with bases loaded um, and one out and do the dance or do what, what the, uh, the next guy did. I can't remember the names, all the pitches. It was another rookie. Around. It was another rookie. So it was, and he it comes was, in and, you know, it gets a, a swinging bunt basically, which scored a run. If that ball's hit at all, uh, the Astros come out of that with nothing. You know, they don't even get a run in that first inning. So uh, that's what it's about for me in the postseason is you've got to take uh, advantage of your opportunities and, and capitalize on things that are given to you. So uh, the Astros have not been doing a good job of that. And the Braves have, and that's why they are where they are right now. And that's why it's really, they always say about getting hot at the right time. But I I think you bring up a good point. We're talking about how careful everybody's being with the bullpens. You have all these arms and you're going to try to protect and put all of these guys in the best situations possible because you have so many different options in your pen. I know that as you get deep into the postseason, you get a little bit thinner, but I just feel like going to Dylan Lee, which nothing against him, just to, to, to be going to a guy that has hardly thrown innings in his big league career was DFA by the Marlins seven months ago. And it's so awesome to see him, you know, get his feet under him and, and be playing <laughs> for a team that might be winning the World Series here. But how do you get to a point where you are letting that guy know when he gets to the park that he is starting? How is that not even floated as a possibility before that, hey, this might be happening? Prepare as if this is happening and then we'll let you know for sure at the ballpark. Something along those lines. And also, how are you getting to the point where you're starting a rookie reliever that barely threw during the year? I don't understand how you get there. I'd love to, you know, we were having the discussion last night. I'd love to hear Snickers, Snickers um, rationale behind starting him. And was there a certain uh, metric that I know he's not a metrics guy, but did somebody convince him that he's got some type of spin rate or something that gives the Astros some kind of trouble or something like that. But, you know, most pitchers have a routine before they, especially before they start and he hasn't even started a game you'd think they'd give him some warning that he could go back to home or wherever his apartment or whatever and do some visualization and, and try to prepare uh, himself for the immense thing that was about to happen to him and get into a World Series game. So um, I'm sure that will, and it's might have, it might have already been written about uh, his decision to, to start him, but I haven't read anything, and, but I'd like to hear that. And, and the Braves won anyways. But the interesting part about it too is that you also put another rookie in a weird spot. Kyle Wright, who was the guy that comes in relief, he was spectacular. Four and two-thirds, five hits, one run, three walks, three strikeouts. Got that dribble. He he really could have got out of that, like you said, without giving up anything, even though the run wasn't charged to him. But Kyle Wright's a guy that would that is used to starting the ball game, not coming in and inheriting a bases loaded situation and in relief, and then being stretched out for four and two-thirds. So I, I thought that side of it was interesting too, where you could have just started Kyle Wright. And then had Dylan Lee as the first guy in relief for whatever reason, they wanted Dylan Lee going after those first three batters didn't work out and Kyle Wright bailed him out. And ultimately it worked out for them in terms of pulling out the victory. But I think you make a good point that they dodged a lot of bullets and 
you can give them credit for getting out of the jams, but you also have to, you know, criticize the Astros where it's due, and they have not come up with the big hit. And they're going to need to come up, like you said, with the big hit for me to go to the World Series because I really want to go. <laughs> I haven't been since 2008. I went with my dad to Tampa Bay, Philadelphia in Philly, uh, which I'll never forget because it was game three and we got there so early, like four o'clock and we're only in Philadelphia for the world series. I'm like, all right, what am I going to do? We're like, yeah, let's just go to the field. Uh, we were staying at like a holiday Inn. all the hotels were booked within 30 minutes. So we were, we weren't hanging out at the hotel. We get to the park where like, when they let us in, we'll watch batting practice. We'll get the full experience. It's raining. And you, know, you finicky players don't take batting practice when it rains, which I was that old when I learned. I didn't know that. Why can't you take batting practice when it rains? Is that, is there something like, what, what's wrong with that? Just, just no. Can't I mean, do it. What, you're asking me actually. I mean, yeah, we're finicky. We don't want to get wet. We can hit <laughs> yeah. underneath. Like, in the actually, tunnel. No. So, but you know, I get that side of it. You don't want to ruin the baseballs too. Don't want to slip, whatever. It's fine. But they also weren't really letting people in the ballpark until a little bit later. So we were just walking around. It starts raining harder. Rain delay till 10. So we were out there for like five hours. And then the game ends up going until the 10th inning. And it was over about three in the morning. And I was falling asleep in my chair. I was, you know, 12 years old. But I thought about it from that component of imagine playing in that game. You're waiting. You're trying to stay amped. You're trying to stay amped. And we've talked about this from trying to survive the rain delays. But when it's a game like that, a world series game where you're just butterflies, butterflies, butterflies. Did you ever have a situation like that? Because also I feel like you, you get the nerves out a little bit by taking BP because you're out on the field, you're taking it in. People start trickling in. You can kind of get your mind right. But in that scenario, you're inside or in the dugout or, or you know, kind of just not really out there getting those butterflies out. Did you ever have a situation like that? And, and how did you manage that uh, before a huge game, just being kind of cooped up in the dugout or in the clubhouse? Well, when you, what, what game was that you said you went to game three of the world series in 2008. So, you know, once you get into the, into the series itself, you know, game one is obviously you start the series and it's just, uh, the festivities prior to game one and the bunting and the thing and the flyovers and the national anthem singers and all this stuff, the introductions, that's a big, big night for a lot of guys. And that uh, will create some tension and some nerves, you know, but once you get into the series, that kind of all goes away and you're starting to play as just a, it's another base, it's another baseball game. Uh, sometimes you see these guys during the course of the year in interleague play. So it's not like you're seeing some foreign team that you've never seen before um and with you know video and everything nowadays you've seen everybody sports center you've seen everybody on other teams so it's basically um that component's taken out of it um and if you can't get fired up i don't care what kind of delay you have if you can't get fired up for a world series game and you go back on that field if you're tired or no that doesn't happen i mean your adrenaline immediately kicks in you know the enormity of every run that's going to be scored you know the enormity of every out that's made every error that's made and uh, guys have no problem getting up for any of those outs in a game. I don't care what the delay is. I, I agree. And it was electric once, once the game got started, even though it was chilly and uh, it was a cool experience, but I would love to be able to go to another one. And uh, you have a friend who is also hoping to go to a world series game. If the Braves can drop this one to the Astros one more time and, and send it back to Houston. I didn't even know this story. You just told me before we were recording but you're friends with an astronaut. I'm just going to kind of leave it there. Yeah. Um, Terry Verts is an astronaut that uh, has piloted the space shuttle. He spent six months on the uh, International Space Station. Uh, left me the most incredible message on my phone ever. I'm actually at one of your games at Pinecrest, sitting <laughs> in the stands one day, and I get a number, and it says Houston. And I'm like, uh, I don't really – at the time, I'm like, ah, I'll let it go to voicemail because I'm watching a game and I don't want to talk while, while the game's going on. So it goes to voicemail and I get a voicemail. So I, I listened to it and he said, Hey Jeff, it's Terry from space. <laughs> My friend was calling me from the international space station. And I was so mad at myself for not actually taking the call and dumb me. I tried to call the number back. And of course it goes to Johnson space center in Houston and a woman answers, hello, Johnson Space Center. I'm like, um, 
Colonel Vertz just called me from the International Space Station. Is there any way you could patch me through? And he's like, she's like, no, sorry. Sorry, sir, you're gonna have to wait till he calls you back. So the next day I get a call from Houston. And of course I answered that one. And I was at another one of your games, but I stood outside the outfield wall there for a long time. And about 30 minutes, I was chatting with Terry Vertz who is orbiting the earth as we were speaking. And uh, I just gotten to do some really super cool things. I we went up for a, a shuttle launch. Uh, the whole family went up for a shuttle launch and we were literally as close as you could be for uh, the last night launch of the space shuttle. And uh, he's got a picture. Uh, he took a picture of one of my baseball cards because each astronaut is allotted a certain amount of weight that they can take on in terms of personal items on a flight. And he, I think it was like 4.3 pounds or something is what he could get up there. And he took one of my baseball cards and he had it floating next to his head and, and took a selfie of it. So I've got that in my room somewhere. So you made it to space. I made it to space. That's like, on the top point. of my bucket list. I'm hoping it'll be a little bit more attainable when I'm 70, 80 years old. I'll just be like, I'm putting my money into that. Sorry, kids. I'm not leaving anything for you. I want to go to space because I, I think that's one of the coolest things in the world. What was your cell phone bill after that call? Because to talk about international, but what about, I mean, what, what is that? Intergalactic? I don't know Intergalactic. what you call that. What's the, what's but, the bill uh, on that? Uh, he made the call. So I don't know. I don't, I don't think my, my, my bill jumped at all. I, I just answered the call from him. So it was, uh, I don't know what his bill was on his side. The U.S. government paid for it. So that's where, the, that, that's where the tax dollars are going. It's to, to, to the long coast. I feel like that there's maybe it's cheaper. I mean, you're right there by the satellite. It sounded, it sounded like we were talking like he was right next to me because he's really? probably next to the satellite. That's that what I'm saying. He's going to call thing, back to back to home so there's no relay going on it was the clearest phone call i've ever had <laughs> it doesn't have to ping back at all but that's a crazy crazy thing and, and so he's hoping to go to a world series game obviously and uh you know he got to go to outer space and that's pretty darn cool but i'd be just as happy going to game six so we'll see what happens well your prediction originally was braves in six i feel like you're gonna stick with that right so you think the astros when people are listening we're either gonna be wrong already but you think the Astros end up pulling one more out? I think the offense is too good. They, they're going to have their backs against the wall. They're experienced as hell. I mean, these guys are all already among some of the best uh, cumulative postseason numbers, and, and they're all still so young. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, they've been through this before, and I think that that team and that offense, you just can't keep down uh, as long as the Braves had. I think they've been fortunate to, to get these three games and – and uh, put them in situations where they're failing, which they don't normally do in the postseason. So no. explosive offense, I think uh, they're going to get through tonight with a victory. And then, you know, my prediction, hopefully it holds true and the, and the Braves close it out first game back at uh, Minute Maid. So let's finish up with the jersey. But one other thing, too, that I wanted to, to mention, because it is the amazing thing about baseball. Ronald Acuna tore his ACL when they were 44 and 44, the Braves at that point. And I said, season over. I mean, season over. Your best player, one of the best players in baseball, tears his ACL when you're 44 and 44, four and a half games behind the Mets. The Mets collapse obviously helped a little bit. But to, to do what they've done is, is unbelievable. Then they lose Charlie Morton, who really has been their guy and is one of the most clutch pitchers in, in, in baseball over the last 30 years in terms of game sevens, in terms of elimination games freak injury there was heartbreaking because I wanted to see Morton and hopefully, I mean, it looks like he's still going to get his ring, but I would like to see him be a little bit more of a part of that because he has been so big for them. How much does it just show that one player doesn't make or break a team, especially with Ronald Acuna? And obviously they went and made moves to, to try to fill the void as much as they could. But I mean, it kind of shows you that one player, Mike Trout on the Angels on the flip side, but Acuna on this Braves team, Yes, he would help them, but I mean, they might win it all without him. Yeah, I think you got to look at, uh, yes, the moves they made were exceptional. And you see the fruits of their labor coming true in this postseason, how well those guys are doing. And uh, they've been riding those coattails with that outfield um, big time. But uh, you look at Brent Snitker, too, and, and see what he's done, the culture in that clubhouse and uh, a leader like Freddie Freeman to rally the troops around a loss like that. You take that. You know, he was in the top three of every offensive category in baseball when he got hurt. So that's a big chunk of offense taken out. Uh, they rallied around each other. And I think, you know, that is a testament to their personalities and the way they handled that injury 
and said, hey, man, we got to move on. Let's move on. And everyone's got to pick up the slack a little bit and uh, make up for that offense they're losing. And, you know, uh, you look at that team and, and Swanson's interview last night was uh, was telling on, you know, how I think the entire team is just a bunch of competitors that get up there and they want it so badly. And they're just uh, they're baseball players and they want to win a baseball game. And that's what they're doing. And I love what Swanson said. I'm paraphrasing, but he's just like, I'm just happy to be here. I feel like when you have that attitude, I'm happy to be here and 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 just you almost play, you want to have the hunger, but you almost play a little bit with, with nothing to lose. Like you're, you're playing with the house's money. And I think sometimes that that's how you got to play. Otherwise the, the pressure kind of mounts. I see a Braves piping here again, I'm assuming. And I'm, I, I think, I think I got this one because I teased it last time. Is it Chipper Jones this time around? Damn it. It's Braves piping though. Right. On the Jersey. Okay. hundred percent Braves. hundred percent Braves. Why does that – Why it looks big. It looks like a big jersey. It is, but maybe I'm smaller now or something, but uh, or, it does or fit pretty big. was the player big. a larger human? No, actually, he wasn't. He was, he was squatty and thick, but I wouldn't say he was a large human. Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. I'm drawing a blank now, and it's going to bother me. Because, oh, Fred McGriff. Nope, we did McGriff. I already had McGriff. We did McGriff the, already? Uh, yeah, we with did McGriff with the Braves. Already. I mean, with the uh, Rays. Uh, Andrew Jones. Nope. Older. Yes. Teammate of mine with two different teams. Teammate of yours with two different teams. That's a tough one. That might even throw a monkey wrench into it. Yeah, you might have just made it worse. Uh, give me five more seconds here, and I'm throwing in the towel. Teammate of yours with two. I've been on a run too. I've been on a pretty good run. Uh. Two different teams. So that would mean he either had to play with the Marlins in the or the Orioles or the Royals or well technically <laughs> the Reds. And then the, the, you forget at the end there, then the Mets. I'm not, I'm not the, the odds of it being the Mets are slim. It's got to be Orioles, Marlins. I'm throwing in the towel. What is it? What is it? He's turning around. Oh, Pendleton, Gary Pendleton. You've mentioned him a few times, so I'm sure you have a story about him. Pendleton was a tough one for me. I don't know if I would have got that one. Hell of a player. I don't know if that would have came to the top of my mind, uh, but you've ta- I, I do remember you telling stories about playing with him and how he's factored into a couple stories, but uh, what do you got on, on, on Gary Pendleton? Just Terry Pendleton. Just Terry, came, Terry uh, Pendleton. And, you know, he came to the Marlins in 96, playing third base for us, and – just one of those guys that I learned so much uh, about the game from him, the way he played the game, he played the game the right way. And just, uh, just a really cool individual. Just a good person, you know, and um, he came to Kansas city when I was there um, in 98, I believe he was with Kansas city. Um, and one of those guys that, you know, we talked about national league MVP he won the MVP, I think in uh, 94, 95 with the Braves and didn't have one of those monster years where like oh yeah it's a clear-cut MVP winner but that's how critical he was to that team uh with the Braves and they had some good players on there but just a cool guy and and I learned a lot uh, about the game of baseball from him and um you know he was one of the ones that I, I definitely want to get him to sign a jersey and a bat he got a, I got a bat for him he used one of the biggest bats you've ever seen too it was uh, bigger than yours oh yeah this thing was a 36 inch bat, um, probably 33 ounces, 34 ounces, but it had a big thick handle to it. It was just a, it looked like a, a, a club that, you know, Bam Bam would use from the Flintstones. And I mean, he, he hit. And what's amazing is, is you mentioned the MVP season, runner up the next year. But what's crazy is he's only, he only made one all-star appearance and won an MVP. I wonder if anybody else, I'm going to get the stat guys on that. If anybody else has one all-star appearance, one MVP, because that, that, that's just be pretty impressive. But cumulatively, he did amazing in his career. Just under 2,000 hits, 270 hitter, but at his peak, just absolutely mashed. And I, I think that's a really, a really cool one, too, that you got me there. But that's a guy, too, that won a lot of division titles with the Braves. But did, did, they, win, did they win a World Series? What year? What year was it? The 95. Braves? Which one? 95? Yeah. So he would have been with you, though, that year, right? 
or he was with the Marlins in 95. All right, then I thought the one, the only one that the Braves won was 95, wasn't it? I got to pull that up now. What year did the – I can't even remember. Or was it 98? Um, 95 was the – yep, 95. They beat the Cleveland Indians. Interesting. It's a long time. You can tell that Atlanta has been waiting, waiting for a it. long time. And they've you had, tell. you know, as we've discussed, they had 14 straight division titles, 14 times for the postseason in a row. And they only came away with one World Series trophy, which makes it even almost more agonizing. Uh, yeah. So, so that's, that's, and if I'm not mistaken, Pendleton's just, is he coached at all? I feel like I've seen him. Yeah, no, he was about the Braves on the Braves staff for quite a while. I'm not I sure thought where so. he is now, but, uh, but, I mean, this is this is a good staff now, and and I'm sure he's he's rooting hard for the Braves at this point uh, because, like we said, it's been a while since his playing days uh, since they've won it. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully, the uh, the Astros can pull one more out, and uh, next time we talk, I can tell you about my experience at the World Series, or uh, we'll be done in five, and uh, it'll be off season mode, and. I'll be begging you to convince me why there won't be a strike uh, or any uh-huh. of those other horrible things that we're going to be facing this off season. Cause it's going to get Let's ugly. Let's not talk about that. Let's no. not even think about that. Let's not think about that. Uh, we saw some reports already. We're going to enjoy baseball. Uh, we're going to enjoy the last couple games and uh, or last game and, and see where it goes. But no matter what, I, I will be very happy for this Braves team. If they pull it out, a lot of good guys on that team clinic, including Freddie Freeman, uh, who I'd love to see uh, get this, get this victory here. So you stick with Braves and six. I'm my prediction was Braves and seven. So I got to roll with it, but I'd be surprised to see the Astros rattle two more, but you never know. Uh, this is going to be a very, very fun finish here. And uh, thank you for talking about the Oh three world series. I wish every day that I was old enough to remember it. Uh, but yeah. I got you to uh, recount the recount it and make me feel like I was there. So I appreciate that. And next time we talk, someone will be a world series champion. It'll be fun to talk about. And I keep forgetting until the end of the episode to ask you about your homework because it's, it's great to me, but you got an 87, right? On your last, on your last exam. My, that's midterm. Yeah. 87 and a half. Eight, actually. 87 and a half. It's important. Yeah. Is that a B that's plus or is that a B? Don't B know. Plus, I think. Yeah. I think oh. it's a B plus. Okay. Why B not? plus. That's all right. We'll take that. Yep. Well, that'll do it for today's episode. Next time we talk, there'll be a World Series champion. We'll see who it is, and we'll see whose prediction was spot on. It's looking better for Jeff. But until next time, this is Outside the Box with Jeff Conant. All right, Arm.